Welcome to chapter 21 of the book of Proverbs, the pious and the impious. We'll see so many of these words mentioned in this chapter. thought it would be a good section heading. I'll read a little in the Greek, and then we'll go through the chapter. As a rush of water, I'm sorry, osper or me, ethatos, utos cardia, vasoleos, in hiri theu, u eon thelon, nevsi, eki, eklinen of tain. As a rush of water, so is the heart of a king in the hand of God. Wherever wishing he should nod, there he leans it. God does what God wants to do, and a king pretty much in the hand of God. Uh, people do and follow what he says whenever he nods his head to do one thing or another. Every man appears just to himself, but the Lord straightens out the heart. You might think you're doing the right thing, living the right type of a life, but you have to put it up against the life that God would want you to have. You may find out that you don't fall into the second category. You're not doing the things according to God, but God will straighten out a heart of a person that wants to do the correct thing. It may take years, but it will happen. God keeps us on the right path, and this Holy Spirit comes into us, teaches us when not to turn right and when to go straight and when to turn a little bit to the left. To do just things and to be truthful are more pleasing to God than a sacrifice of blood. So you can be going to church, raising your hands in praise, but if the rest of the week you're not doing the things that what God wants to do, uh, if you're not being uh, doing the righteous things, or being truthful, then that's not what is acceptable to God. A high-minded man is bold-hearted in insolence. We'll find out about a man like that a little later in this chapter. And the torch of the impious ones is sin. That's what leads them in their impiousness um, into sin, is their attitude towards what is right and what is wrong. The thoughts of the vigorous are in plenty, and everyone hastening is in less, and precipitous is this hastening. So the thoughts of somebody that are working hard, planning ahead, building something or planting something, then they will reap the reward, where a person is precipitous, doesn't do the correct planning and does things wrong, we'll find out that what he's getting is not what the other person received. The one producing treasures by a lying tongue pursues vanity. You're lying and you think you're going to get something, but you're not. In the long run, God will not allow you to succeed. There may be a few people that appear to be succeed, uh, succeeding, but in the long run, most people that are doing, uh, pursuing vanities, lying and all this, end up in jail, prison, or a bad situation. And it comes into the snare of death eventually. Ruin to the impious ones is welcomed as a guest. Uh, they're impious, so ruin is going to come to them, and this is sort of a uh, poetic way of saying it. it's welcomed as a guest. They're doing it, so they're almost like, oh, yeah, uh, let's do the impious things, and ruin comes. For they do not prefer to do the just things. To the crooked ones, scolios, we have scoliosis. Uh, God sends crooked ways, and they go, and instead of going on the right way, they want to go off and do something illegal, then God allows them to, and they end up becoming on a road that is not where they should be, and they'll find out eventually they end up in the canyon, the dead end, 
and running out of gas and bad situation. For his works are pure and straight, and that would be God. And I think of Jesus, pure, sinless, and is ortho, orthopedics, ortho, straighten. Better to live upon a corner of the housetop in the open air than houses being whitewashed with injustice. And in a profane house and living in some place with people that are um, being um, sinning and profane, hate God, make fun of him and everything, that is a terrible place to be. Better to be homeless. The soul of an impious one desires evils, and it shall not be shown mercy by any one of men that the soul of the person. With the penalizing of an unrestrained man, the guileless man becomes more clever. Uh, if you chastise and guileless, naive, that's doing actions that are unrestrained, then um, he'll continue doing them because he's naive. He won't understand the um, ways of somebody counseling him to do something better. Doesn't want to hear it. But by perceiving the opposite, a wise one will receive knowledge. A just one perceives the heart's of the impious ones, and he treats the impious ones as worthless in their evils. Doesn't want anything to do with them. The one who shuts up his ears to not hear the weak, even himself shall call out, and there will not be one listening. And somebody needs your help or your or money or something, you don't want to help them, then when you need something, you won't have somebody to help you. A private present prostrates angers, giving something somebody a gift. If sending flowers to your girlfriend, she's something angry at you. But the one sparing gifts shall raise up strong rage. And so you're not basically trying to overcome um, the anger of the other person, not overcome it, but placate the person. You want to keep the anger going, so that's what will happen. Best to make peace with somebody that you're angry with or it's angry with you, and Jesus uh, goes into that, and in, in you see that in the Gospels. It is gladness of the just ones to have equity, fairness, but a sacred one is unclean by evildoers. A man wandering from out of the way of righteousness shall rest in the gathering of giants. Now, the gathering of giants. We see giants, Giganton, 1095.2, first mentioned in Genesis um, 6, 4. In the Hebrew, it's the Raphaim. And I, King James may even call him Raphaim. In Genesis 6-4, it says, And the giants were upon the earth in those days, and it, after that the sons of God continually entered to the daughters of men and procreated for themselves. Those were the giants from the eon, the renowned men. Now, and the, after that the sons of God continually entered to the daughters of men. A lot of people have a lot of ideas what that means, but studying the word here, I'm not going to go into too much what I think it means. Uh, they were, were they non-earthly beings, sons of God, or were they earthly beings that were made, uh, I believe they're earthly beings, maybe something different than us humans who were made in the image of God. And then in Genesis 10, 8, and 9, it says, And Cush procreated Nimrod. This one began to be a giant 
upon the earth. This one was a giant hunter with hounds. And First Chronicles 1.10 also mentions that. Genesis 14.5, it says, And they cut in pieces the giants of the one ones in Ashtaroth, Karnaim, Chedorlaomer, the king of Edom. And we met, as mentioned, the giants living in this area in Edom, which is uh, to the east of the Dead Sea. And it's also, they're mentioned in Joshua 12, 4 and 13, 12. In Numbers 13, 33, when the 12 men went into the land of Canaan the first time, it says, and we saw the giants. So scared the people, didn't want to go into the promised land, didn't want to go into the land of Canaan, ended up in the wilderness 40 years. 2 Samuel 21, 18, it says, Then Sebache the Hushathite struck the ones assembling of the descendants of the giants. So uh, these giants, huge people, um, Goliath was one, I believe. And these, and then in 2 Samuel 21, 22, it says, And these four were born to descendants of the giants in Gath, which would have been in Philistia where, um, where, where um, Goliath was, to the house of Rapha, Raphaim, so went on down throughout history with these people. And they fell by the hand of David and of his servants. And they had a place, it's mentioned in First Chronicles 11.15, and the camp of the Philistines pitched in the valley of the giants. This is where a war happened with the Israelites. In First uh, Chronicles 20, verse 6, it says, And came to pass yet again a war in Gath, that is in Palestine today, and was there an immense man, and his fingers and toes were six by six, 24, and this one was a descendant of the giants. So these people were different than what we see today. Uh, there's a video I saw of a man in England who has um, six finger, six uh, digits. Didn't show anything about his toes, but I think he had two thumbs. And all kids wanted to look at him and touch and shake his hand because he had that. I want to call it a deformity. Maybe we're the ones that are deformed and he's original. <laughs> But then again, in First Chronicles 20, verse 6, it says, And came to pass yet again a war in And I'm sorry, that's the one I just did. And now also the giants are mentioned in Isaiah 3, 13, 3, and it relates it to Babylon. And then in Ezekiel 32, 21, it talks about uh, giants being related to uh, Egypt. Now going to 21, 17, a man lacking loves uh, gladness, being fond of wine and oil and wealth. Somebody that, I don't know, lacking, I'm not exactly sure, but somebody that uh, lacking common sense, I would say, loves all these other things rather than God. And the rubbish of a just one is a lawless one, and for upright ones, a law breaker. Uh, it's another poetic way of saying it. They're, they're, the lawless one is as rubbish. A lawbreaker is as rubbish to God. Better to live in the wilderness than with a wife being combative and talkative and prone to anger. Well, that is an interesting verse. It might be better, but it might not be possible. <laughs> God has you in a place you have a bunch of kids, and you might have a wife that's combative, prone to anger. I guess you just have to grin and bear it the best you can. A desirable treasure shall rest upon the mouth of a wise one. Something that is wonderful, a desirable treasure. Could be spiritual, could be something physical. Um, I have, God gives me spiritual treasures of being able to do these videos, but then I get other treasures, like hopefully I'll get a new laptop, Apple laptop is coming out. So God 
is a disperser of good things. But foolish men will swallow it, uh, the desirable treasure. The way of righteousness and charity shall find life and glory. A wise one mounts against a fortified city, and he demolishes the fortress upon which the impious ones relied upon. So they're more or less saying that the just ones will conquer over the impious ones. May not happen in life, may happen when we go to be with the Lord. And it mentions that how the, uh, our enemies will be uh, under our feet, a footstool for our feet. One who guards his mouth and the tongue carefully keeps his soul from out of affliction. And um, it's easy to say the wrong thing and get yourself into trouble, isn't it? Um, I've done that many times. And sometimes it's like, well, maybe I shouldn't even be talking because uh, people get upset with uh, what you say. And so I had uh, one man has two dogs and he was overbearing and I had my dog Arlo at the time, a little black and white Boston Terrier. And he, um, I pulled up where the man was and Arlo started barking. He'd just go crazy at these two. Um, they were uh, Irish setters, really nice dogs. But uh, once he told him he was, if I didn't stop Arlo from barking, he was going to sick him on Arlo. I'm thinking, well, make Arlo's day. <laughs> but so anyway, we get out of the car. Arlo's barking. And I'm and I started laughing, and I have in front of in front of my house the Apostolic Bible Polyglot, a big sign, and he knows who I am because he walks by every day, and then so Arlo's barking, and he says, "Well," and I'm laughing, and he says, "Well, that's not the Christian thing to do," and I said, "Well, Arlo's not a Christian." Well, I thought it was funny. I don't know if he did, but sometimes we have to watch what we say. A bold and self-willed and ostentatious man is called pestilent. And this is the person I was mentioning earlier. And his name is Nabal. And the story is in 1 Samuel 25, where this man Nabal um, was uh, very rich, had a lot of uh, cattle, sheep. And the men of David's group watched over him when they were in a certain area. Uh, so nobody would harm them. And then later, David needed some help, and he sent men to go to Nabal to ask for help. Nabal got mad and kicked him out, said he's not going to do anything. It's a bunch of bums. And so David was going to go there with his men and kill Nabal. But his um, wife, uh, oh, shoot, I forgot her name. Uh, later, he, he married her. I can't think of it, but um, she came with a bunch of food and placated David so he didn't have to uh, come in and kill the people. And then when Nabal found out what she did, he had a heart attack and died. And then David sent uh, men to uh, have her, oh, I got it on the tip of my tongue, uh, to be his uh, wife. Verse 25, desires kill the lazy, for uh, then resolve not. For his hands resolve not to do anything, the lazy person. An impious one lusts, evil lusts the whole day. Oling, whole, almost a transliteration. But the just one desires mercy and pities unsparingly the just person, pitying and being uh, merciful. So we are to be these things, to be a just person, having mercy on somebody that we can maybe send to jail because of something they did, um, or pitying somebody. I went on the side of my house a couple of days ago to dump 
some um, weeds that I dump over the side of the hill uh, from my Escalonia bush that I trim. And as I went on the other side of the long line of Escalonia, probably 30 feet long, there's a guy laying there sleeping, young guy. Well, you know, I said, what's going on? And he jumped up and I said, this is, you're right where I dump all my uh, stuff, but you're welcome to move down a little bit and sleep if you want. Uh, that's fine. And then he apologized and got up and left. No, I didn't make him leave. But, uh, you know, I, if we run across people, instead of condemning them, it's so easy to do that. This is not what God wants us to do as Christians. I was at a, I preached at a rescue mission for, oh, three years. A lot of people coming in hurting with a lot of problems, just getting out of jail, going through uh, family problems and so forth, end up in the rescue mission. Now, you can look at everybody with a hard heart, not want to help, but yet these rescue missions that do help people that are um, having problems, well, you know, I think it's good. They were able to come in and get jobs. Now, the amount of money and the amount of help and effort and everything and the amount of success um, was is questionable, and somebody could say, well, just... You know, is it really worth doing all that uh, because of uh, the time it takes? But uh, I think it probably is. Sacrifices of impious ones are an abomination to the Lord, for even they bring them unlawfully. And this was in the time of the sacrifices. And to us, again, sacrifice of praise and being Doing things wrong is not good. A lying witness shall perish. Martis, a martyr uh, witness, and a psevdi pseudo. A man who is subject will speak guardedly. So a man who um, is careful of what he says, um, subject to his, holding his temper or controlling his mouth, having his mouth being subject to his will, uh, is uh, will speak guardedly. An impious man impudently stands in front, but the upright man himself perceives his ways. Jesus mentions how um, if you, uh, uh, when you go to a uh, feast, instead of going and sitting up front, wanting to be there, and then the man, a man more important than you comes in and the head of the what of the feast comes and asks you then to sit, and the only place is in the very back row. You end up in the back row, and Jesus says, "No, we're to you know not to want to be impudent, stand in the front." There is not wisdom, and there is not courage, and there is no counsel to the impious ones. Remember the beginning, pious and impious. How many times in this chapter? A horse or horse uh, is prepared for a day of battle. Polemu, and this is what they, this was a tank uh, of the days of battle back at the time of the Bible. But help is by the Lord. The tank can be very good. You can have tremendous arms and armaments, but the Lord can help and overcome a force that is much stronger than you by his uh, power. I look at a possible future war that is mentioned in the, I think, 38th, 39th chapter of Ezekiel, how uh, this army coming against Jerusalem is destroyed. And uh, very. I think it possibly could be via enemy fire, that this army could very well have a secret code like the Americans had when they went into Iraq. And the code uh, would tell you that if somebody was a enemy or it was a, or, you know, one of the your forces. So uh, let's say XXX means it's a friend and YYY means it's an enemy. But now if somehow, somehow you got into the myth, middle of that 
and you translate it, trans, um, translate it, transmitted it, you know, changed it around, then the enemy for the enemy, and there theirs was the uh, so then the enemy's looking for the oh, I forgot which one it was one x x x or y y y, but anyway the enemy now is shooting and destroying his own forces, not knowing. And this has happened two or three times in the Bible where the enemy of Israel has fought with themselves. So I think there's, and God is the one that could do that, Uh, give Israel uh, the code of the enemy or do it himself and change it. So we'll see. Chapter 22, the benefits of wisdom. What are the benefits? We'll find out next video seminar. Hope you join us. Till then, God bless.